I have some exciting news for you. Starting now, you can listen to Haunted Places episodes that are older than six months, completely ad-free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. We're always looking for ways to improve the listener experience. We found an amazing partner in Stitcher to bring you episodes ad-free six months after they're released. Again, this will only affect episodes that are older than six months. Nothing else will change. We'll still be releasing new Haunted Places episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. For a free month trial, go to stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. That's stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. Lillian did not like her stepfather. There was a coldness in him, a hunger she couldn't understand or describe. She'd kept her thoughts to herself. But now her mother's body was in a closed casket. Her mind conjured up images of how her mother must have looked after the car accident. She'd left the wake when these thoughts became too much, heading back to her mother's beloved home. Something brushed against her shoulder. Lillian turned to find who touched her, but she was alone. The light above her went out. She swallowed a yelp and waited. Then the next light went out, and the next, carrying the darkness to the very edge of the glassy pane and the door beside. The door to her mother's room. A hand pushed her, softly at first, and then harder, when Lillian still refused to move. She tripped over her own feet and fell to the floor. She realized the lights were on again. She looked up, and each turned off in turn. One, two, three, pulling her down the hall. She saw a figure standing in front of the closed door to her mother's bedroom. Rage filled Lillian. Her own foibles aside, no one should be over here. They had no right to rifle through her mother's things. She ran toward the door. The figure became translucent. It almost looked like her mother, but there was something wrong. The top of her head was caved in. She only had one eye. She nodded to the door. Lillian placed a trembling hand on the doorknob. The figure vanished when she opened the door slowly. It was the walls she noticed first. The floral wallpaper, her mother's beloved floral wallpaper, was damaged. She stared at it, trying to understand where the splotches of brown and faded scarlet had come from. Her gaze dropped to the floor. There was more. And then she realized what she had been staring at. Blood. Her mother's blood. Welcome to Haunted Places. I'm Greg Polson. Every Thursday, I take you to the scariest, eeriest, most haunted, real places on earth. This week, join me on a supernatural journey to the Harvey Public Library in North Dakota and find out why, to this day, it's haunted. Listen to more episodes of Haunted Places, as well as ParCast's other podcasts, on your favorite podcast directory. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, at ParCast, on Twitter, at Parcast Network and at parcast.com. Many of you have asked how you can support Haunted Places. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. Harvey is a railway town of less than 2,000 in central North Dakota. Harvey itself makes up less than two square miles of the sprawling landscape. They have their own elementary and high schools with enrollment of about 200 each and their own one-screen movie theater open Friday through Monday. 
the date night special of two tickets, two drinks, and a tub of popcorn can be yours for just $20. But the Harvey Public Library is one of the town's main features. It is not known for its impressive book selection, but rather its very peculiar location. The library sits on a site with a very dark history, one that left that particular plot of land cursed forever. Jacob Bentz was born with a gaping emptiness that could only be filled with greed. He hungered for money. Each day was spent counting down the hours until he would receive his next paycheck. But there was never enough to fill that hole inside of him. He always wanted more. For years, he'd watched Sophia Eberlein. The Russian immigrant was pretty, but that wasn't what caught his attention. It was her money that he wanted. She married one of Harvey's most successful businessmen, Hugo Eberlein. Jacob passed by their house on his way to work every morning and felt his intestines tie themselves in knots of jealousy. When Hugo died, Jacob saw his opening. He didn't give Sophia enough time to think. She was nearing 40 now and alone. He wooed her quickly and begged for her hand in marriage. She later admitted to him that she'd been in such a haze of grief that she didn't even remember their wedding day. Such an admission could have hurt another man, but Jacob didn't need her love. Hugo had left her a tidy sum, and Jacob now possessed it. He'd lasted three years this way, keeping his hunger in check with a reminder of their wealth, putting up with the stories of her dead love. It was exhausting for him to pretend that he cared about her and her children, but he did his best. Then his birthday came around, 49. He had one more day before he'd enter the last year of his half century, and he'd spend it with his postule of a wife, and the next year, and the next, and the next. He deserved a very nice birthday present. The sign stood out to him like a beacon. Purchase your life insurance policy today. It was too obvious, but he was tempted. He laid next to Sophia that night, plotting her murder. He could strangle her with her own pillow, crush her windpipe with his bare hands, hang her body from the chandelier downstairs. There were so many delicious ways to kill her. All of them would point back to him, they'd keep his money from him. He would be the first suspect. If the body was mangled, his problems were solved. No police, no more conversations. He could spend her money. No, his money, as he pleased. The gnawing emptiness eroded any misgivings. He needed this. He purchased a life insurance policy for her. $50,000 for an accidental death enough to stop his insides from devouring him. Sophia snored loudly. He stared at her figure in the dim light. He tried to conjure some emotion from his chest, but felt nothing. His grip tightened around the hammer. The house was silent, but unease warred with his greed. Sweat gathered on his brow. If he was lucky, one fell swoop would solve his problems. He took a deep breath and brought the hammer down on her skull. A reedy crack cut through the silence. Her eyes fluttered open and he panicked. He brought the hammer down on her head again and again. Blood splashed across his face, the bedspread, the wall, the floor. Some dark force overtook his body. The blood started to excite him. The light had long since faded from her eyes, but he continued to hit her. As the blood slowed, he switched to the rest of her body. Had to be sure, right? With every swing, her white cotton nightgown turned more and more red. 
The emptiness was finally soothed. After two years of resenting his wife, he felt his emotions spilling out alongside Sophia's blood. The taste of newfound freedom was salty, metallic, and warm. When there was nothing left for him to destroy, he took a step back and admired his work. His feet slipped slightly from the blood on the floor. Jacob pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his face. His passion cooled slightly, the dark force sliding from his body and back into the shadows. He hoisted Sophia's lifeless body and dragged it down the hallway. Her legs caught on the trim and he pulled harder. A trail of blood followed behind her. He'd clean it later. He dropped her weight entirely to open the basement door. It creaked open slowly. He picked her body up again and heaved it down the stairs. Her body stuck halfway down. He lumbered down the stairs and pushed her the rest of the way. The door to the furnace squeaked open. He tried to light it, but the fire wouldn't catch. Although the room had been still before, any time he struck a match, some hidden draft would snuff it out. A chill bit at his hand as he tried another match. He dropped the matchbook on the ground. As he bent to pick it up, he heard a groan slip past Sophia's lips. He crept toward her body to check if some ounce of life had managed to escape his hammer. But she lay still where he had left her. No part of her had moved while he'd been busy with the furnace. Yet it pulled him a bit from his purpose. If she simply disappeared, that invited questions. Questions would mean more delay. Hmm, no. There was a better way. <clears throat> Jacob dragged the body back up the stairs and out of the house. He pulled the passenger door open to Sophia's car and propped her up inside. A ragged moan escaped from Sophia as Jacob slid into the driver's seat. Or was he just imagining it? He gripped the steering wheel tightly. They stopped at a neighbor's farm, and Jacob stole straw from their barn. He filled the back seat. As he drove, the noises from Sophia got louder and louder. Jacob hummed to himself to drown it out, but the sounds kept getting louder. He pulled to a stop six miles out of town at the precipice of a cliff. Sophia's corpse was still as Jacob carried her from the passenger side to the driver's seat. Yet he felt hot breath on the back of his neck. Once she'd been strapped in, he set the straw on fire. Flames licked the interior of the car, destroying the leather seats. He watched as the fire singed the hair off the few pieces of scalp that remained. When the corpse was more bone than skin, Jacob stood behind the car and pushed. Slowly, it tipped forward and went over the edge. As he watched it fall, he swore he could hear the wind screaming. Everyone believed the working-class Jacob Bentz when he claimed that his recent bride, Sophia Eberline, a wealthy widow, had died in a car accident. Car accidents were more common and more deadly in 1931 than they are today. It was Lillian Eberline's discovery of the blood in her mother's bedroom that turned the tide on Jacob Bentz. He confessed in full to Sophia's murder and died in prison in 1944. We'll have more about the effects of that murder in the small town of Harvey after the break. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, 
Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. Parcast New Mythology Podcast dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. Hosted by my friend Vanessa Richardson, Mythology uses an ensemble cast to bring these stories to life. Every episode dramatizes an exciting story pulled from the beliefs of ancient cultures and gives insight into how our ancestors saw the universe. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythologies Part 1 on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. Have you checked out Shudder yet? They're AMC Network's premium streaming video service, and they have the largest, fastest growing human curated selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment. They're kind of like the Netflix of horror. One of the things I love about Shudder is that there are new, spine tingling thrillers, shocking horrors, and edge of your seat suspense added weekly. You can get unlimited access for only $4.99 a month or $49.99 a year. Last week I streamed an exclusive Shudder title, 31 by Rob Zombie, on my Roku. But you can also stream ad-free from Apple devices, Android devices, and many others. I'm looking forward to their upcoming release, True Terror. Until then, there's still a vast selection of programming, whether it's from their international library, old classics like Heather's, or my personal favorite, Wolf Cop. There's something for everybody. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com slash podcast and use promo code HAUNTED30. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com slash podcast. Promo code HAUNTED30. Now, back to the story. From 1931 onward, there were rumors of supernatural activity in places that had been important to Sophia Eberlein. But it didn't become serious until her house was moved. The town of Harvey hoped to build a public library in a central and convenient location, and the position of Hugo and Sophia Eberlein's home had reflected Hugo's success and stature in the community. It seemed a shame to destroy a beautiful house, so they picked it up and moved it, making way for a brick-and-mortar building to house the latest in 1990s library technology. The Harvey Public Library opened in 1990, on the 59th anniversary of Sophia's funeral. The day her daughter Lillian discovered her mother's room had been bathed in blood. There's nothing in life that can prepare you for the act of dying. No one teaches you how. How to wait for 50 years in a house that is at once too quiet and too loud. You push things, pull them, try to say you're here, but they don't listen. Then you just want them to leave you alone, but they ask questions, they move things, they don't believe, and you stop believing too. That monstrosity of a library was built where my house once stood. The workers couldn't hear me over the whir of their great machines as they built anew. I was torn apart, my already unfamiliar surroundings turning against me. Wooden floors swelling till they cracked, windows screaming with non-existent winds, shattering in jagged spiderwebs, until all was quiet, unearthly quiet. I blinked and my house was whole again, windows shining, floor pristine. It was 
I who cracked, my very skin fractured like porcelain, a doll beaten on steel rebar. Somehow it was easier to imagine than the cruel, squelching reality of my last moments, the mangled red wetness that had once been my head. I walked the creaking floorboards of my home. It was filled with children again. All of them looked like my little girls. Their clothes were informal, caps worn indoors, covering messy haircuts. They held small boxes with screens in their hands, tapping buttons as their friends gathered round. I wanted them out, and I wanted to keep them in. It felt like the whole of my small town packed into my home. Old, as cold as the Dakota winters. I opened my mouth to speak, but only a whisper hit the air. Harsh, grating. Somewhere in my mind, the fire burned, the leather of the seat crackling as it met the blistering heat. She kept stuffing things into her cavern of a purse. I touched her shoulder as she picked up a bag of packed up grocery store cookies left over from the grand opening. They dropped to the ground, crumbling. I was destruction incarnate everywhere and nowhere. But then, bricks enclosed me, hot metal, ash and half-burnt refuse. I was in the car again, burning, burning. Too fast and not fast enough. I felt Jacob pacing outside, waiting. I'd locked her office door. She was pulling, shaking it, beginning to panic. I jumped away, and she began to scream. I realized that she could see me. I'd gotten what I wished for, and I regretted every moment. Whatever she saw me as, whatever I looked like, must have been grotesque. Was this my fate? To be alone and horrifying even to look upon. To live back and forth, back and forth, always reliving my horrible death, always here in this terrible and unsettlingly quiet place. The woman was glued to the floor, sweat dripping down her face. As I snapped back to where I was and not where I'd been, I saw her desk floating above her head. The whole room was floating. The desk vibrated back and forth, sending papers and books to the floor. I knew it was me, but I had no control. I was intoxicated from the pain and my fickle, unstable reality. The poor girl struggled with the door, yanking the handle as hard as she could, but it wouldn't budge. She rose again and charged toward the door. I tried to help by opening it. She crashed through and hit the floor. She struggled down the hallway, slipped on the newly waxed floor, pulled herself up as fast as she could. Bruises formed. My own bruises throbbed, spread like ink and water. I needed it to stop, the winter wind, the flames. I never thought I'd long for the car again. I locked the doors and shut off the rest of the lights. I needed the quiet, if just for a moment, any type of quiet. I stayed still, trying to leave her alone. And just like that, she ran. My heart pounded, pulse raced. I walked the floors of my home, but my home wasn't there. The wind howled, the brick of the building sighed, bent and broke. Books dropped from the shelves, 
A torrent of ivory pages and plastic dust jackets glinting at the light of the cold, cruel moon. The woman dived for the brand new circulation desk, grasping for the phone. The books were falling faster now. Heavy tomes and encyclopedia volumes. She'd just gotten the dial tone when she fell to the floor. I tried with all my effort to stop, to stay still for just a moment. All was quiet. No destruction. Only mess. Fixable. All fixable. A repetitive beeping echoed from the phone. I realized the librarian was trying to calm herself in the shelter of the desk, cowering. She was still clutching the broken cookies. I pulled away. Or perhaps something pulled me. What was normally translucent or invisible became flesh and blood. The broken bones protruding from my legs hindered my progress, but she had only just realized the doors were locked. She banged against them, and I reached out. Her eyes widened as she took in the full picture of me. I saw my reflection in the window, and I understood why she'd run. I'd been pretty once, but I wasn't anymore. I was a collection of pieces sewn together with the thinnest of threads. The decrepit child's toy that no one wanted. And then I felt the feeling rise, the hatred with which I was murdered. It was imprinted deeply within me, and I could not stop it from rising now. The farthest shelf began to sway back and forth. I felt the librarian tense. The first shelf fell, then another. She began to cry, tears falling in messy, almost gelatinous drops down her face. Then she said my name. Was it my name? Did the whole of me, the monster of me, have a name at all? Had it ceased to exist? And yet she said it in a hoarse, questioning, desperate voice. Sophia. Yes, that was what my mother had called me. Sophia to family. Sophie to Hugo. I missed Hugo. I missed my girls. I saw the horror on my daughter's face when she saw my room covered in blood. It was the past. But I saw it now. I saw him now. And I would end him. The last shelf fell, arcing toward the librarian with a heavy final weight. I held it with all my spectral strength, strength I didn't know I had. The woman looked at me with wide, staggered eyes. Run, I said, with no throat to speak. You should run. She stepped swiftly to the side, and I let the shelf fall, crashing down in a cascade of cheap wood and hard covers. I looked at her. She looked at me. She was my daughter. Seeing the truth for the first time, seeing the blood on her mother's walls. No, that was a different time, a different place. That wasn't here. I closed my eyes and willed myself into the quiet, the blackness. I could wait. I could hide. Someone hadn't forgotten me. And that was enough to hang on a little bit longer. From the time the Harvey Public Library opened, citizens around town spoke of the strange, paranormal nature of the place. Lights would suddenly burst. Books would fall off the shelves. Everyone said that Sophia had never left the site where she was murdered. She remained there, even when her house was moved 
and the library was built, confined to the very spot where she met her brutal end. We'll have more of Sophia's ghost after the break. It's not a ParCast podcast, but if you like haunted places, I think you might like The Horror of Dolores Roach, a new horror fiction podcast I found. The Horror of Dolores Roach tells a macabre urban legend of murder, betrayal, weed, gentrification, cannibalism, and survival of the fittest. When Dolores Roach returns to her old New York City neighborhood after 16 years in prison, she's stunned by all that's changed. The only person remaining from her previous life is Luis, an old stoner friend who gives her room and board in the basement underneath his dilapidated empanada shop. When the promise of her newfound stability is quickly threatened, Magic Hands Dolores is driven to extremes to survive. The Horror of Dolores Roach stars Daphne Rubin Vega and Bobby Cannavale and is written by Aaron Mark. I think it's a great podcast, but don't take my word for it. Refinery29 says, The Horror of Dolores Roach stands out from the rest. It's totally fictional, but still equally chilling. You can listen to all episodes of The Horror of Dolores Roach now for free, wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the story. By the early 2000s, rumors of strange activity in the Harvey Public Library had become almost pedestrian. Paranormal investigators showed up now and then. The librarians told them the tales. They noticed a few anomalies in the public computers and left. But that didn't mean Sophia wasn't there. Ever the society lady, Sophia loved to make a grand entrance. And when she wanted to make herself known, she certainly did. Christopher was the kind of kid who liked books more than people. Even the librarians knew to leave him alone when he was in the one place in Harvey, North Dakota, where it felt like he fit. Which is why, when they dared him, he had to do it. If someone else broke into the library, his library, in order to return Sophia Eberlein's supposed family heirlooms and conjure a ghost, they'd probably do something awful. Christopher spent an awful lot of time in the library, and he noticed the flickering lights and cold spots, but he'd never observed anything out of the ordinary. Logan, the biggest of his bullies, told Christopher all he needed to do was head into the library at midnight and drop the items on the circulation desk. Logan's aunt had apparently married into the last of Sophia's family and had taken the jewelry with her when the relationship got complicated. That's what the adults said. Complicated. Logan and his two goons had left the window just slightly open before the library had closed. Probably the first time they'd been in the space at all. Christopher squeezed his chubby body through the window, landing on the floor with a skid. Great. Now he had rug burns. They nodded him toward the circulation desk. It was lit by the icy blue light of an idling computer monitor. Just a few steps. A few steps and he'd be done. Christopher walked forward. Now they were in the library. Why were they in the library? Logan nodded, urging Christopher forward as his two friends peeled off. The silence in the room, which had always felt comforting to Christopher, was unnerving now. Suddenly, he heard a slam behind him. The older of the two goons had knocked a whole row of books to the ground. Come on, Logan nodded at Christopher. Get to it. He wasn't the type of kid who could muster a surprisingly strong punch or an eviscerating remark. He had to do what they said. Christopher turned away from the mischief and walked toward the circulation desk. Goosebumps rose on his arms as the temperature of the room began to drop. There was no familiar hum of an air conditioner to soothe his mind. He took two more steps forward, and the feeling of cold dissipated. 
About 10 feet away, Logan's smaller goon was paging through a massive anatomy book. Christopher already knew what he was looking for. The boy smirked with the joy of discovery and reached to tear the page out. Suddenly, the book slammed closed, locking his fingers in its heavy grip. Christopher watched the boy grimace as he pulled his hand free. Get on with it, Logan gestured. Christopher felt cold again. He reached the circulation desk. The fluorescent light just above the desk turned on. A single beam of brightness in the darkness. Logan remained unimpressed, but Christopher had been to the library at both open and close. He knew all the overheads were on the same switch. The light flickered, giving off that uncomfortable buzz of a dying bulb. Hands trembling. Christopher removed a bulging handkerchief from his bag and unwrapped it slowly. The light stopped flickering. The jewelry glittered under the searing white beam from above. For a moment, he smelled old flowers. At once, powdery, sweet, and rotten. The light surged and burst. Christopher dove underneath the desk as glass fell from above. Logan and his friends yelped and took cover as well. But then, the smaller one was already barreling toward the window. It snapped shut, nearly slicing his fingers off. Logan grabbed his friend and pulled him to cover. Footsteps echoed on the waxed floor on the other side of the desk. Christopher shut his eyes tightly. When he finally got up the nerve to look silently around the corner of the desk, he could see Logan and his friends hiding under a table by the door. His bully's eyes were following something Christopher couldn't see. Something on the other side of the desk. Something walking. All the color had drained from his face. The steps stopped. He held his breath and tried to stay absolutely still, feeling the presence just above him. Logan locked eyes with Christopher. He could see the older boy deciding if he was going to leave him. But before he could make what was probably a very easy decision for him, Logan looked up. The book slammed on the table above his head. He stifled a yelp as books began to fall from nearby shelves. Fall was the wrong word. Fly was better. The three boys scrambled out from under their cover, backing away as the table was thrown backward, leaving an open, empty space. The book seemed to move like birds, slamming to the ground in a swiftly growing pattern. M-I-N-E. A gray figure stood in front of them. Large round holes where eyes should be. No mouth or nose. Her dress was gray and practical, but singed. Singed everywhere. Flames still burning in the skirt, though she paid them no heed. The air smelled of smoke, even though there wasn't any. Logan closed his eyes, gripping his friends tight. The figure moved away from the window, standing inches from his face. Logan and his boys slammed into the emergency exit bar at the front door and ran into the night. The alarm screamed. Christopher finally found the courage to stand up, carefully. But then, he froze. The pale woman was standing between him and the door. Her back was to him, watching the boy's retreating forms grow smaller and smaller as they passed under each lonely streetlight. Slowly, she turned. In the rush and fear, he hadn't noticed that her lips were intact. They were glossy, shimmering, wet. Why? He didn't want to know. He realized she was smiling. Christopher could barely breathe. Then she put her finger to her lips in a silent shh. 
and then she walked past him back into the library. He turned and saw her give him that grin one last time before disappearing behind a shelf. Christopher finally let the air escape his lungs. It felt as if time had stopped, but the alarm was still blaring. The police station was close. They'd be here soon. He burst out the door and ran for the road, the soft glow of the street lamp on the corner. If he had looked back, he would have seen her, still smiling from the window, as the books, shelves, and tables slid back into place behind her. There are certain markers of urban legend. A cousin's cousin's cousin supposedly said they saw Sophia in the window as they left the library holding their latest Harlequin romance to their chest. One of the kids at Harvey High School broke in to find all the tables moved, the computers on in the middle of the night. But no one ever says which kid or which cousin it was. It's a rare thing to find a source willing to go on the record, though we do have one. In 2009, Harvey's library director, Marlene Ripplinger, told the Grand Forks Herald that Sophia's a friendly ghost, if a little inconsiderate when it comes to her fellow readers' needs. She borrows books, disappearing them for weeks at a time, only to leave them on the circulation desk when she's finished. And why shouldn't she? She's a citizen of Harvey, too. It's oldest, not quite so living, citizen. Sophie, as the town likes to call her, is friendly. Or at least Ripplinger says. That's how they feel before Halloween. October 3rd is Jacob Vance's birthday. Sophie was murdered on October 2nd. Strange activity in the library increases until the holiday itself. The lights flicker. Sophie's book borrowing becomes more frequent. The librarian's hands are always cold, bruised, as if someone is holding them as tight as she can, terrified of letting go. She works late these times. It's not because of Sophie. She's not sure she believes that much. No, there's festivities to plan witchy story times to organize, decorations to hang, even when being on a ladder when the lights suddenly shut off was not ideal. <laughs> She'd carefully made her way off the ladder and back to the light switch when she realized how tired she was. She packed up her things and reached for her keys. They were gone. <laughs> she searched her office, the front desk, the stacks where she'd been reshelving. She got up her nerve and ascended the ladder again, despite her aching feet. She couldn't imagine a world where she'd left her keys next to the plastic jack-o'-lanterns she'd spaced along the room's perimeter, but she was growing frustrated. The lights went out again, plunging the whole library into darkness. At first, all she could hear was her own breathing the gentle wooden squeak of the ladder beneath her feet, settling under her slightly shifted weight. Then, somewhere in the depths of the stacks, she heard a match being struck. She turned her head. It hadn't caught. She placed one foot on the lower rung of the ladder, then another. Another match ripped across the unseen striking surface. Again, it didn't catch. The librarian's feet were on the ground now. She crept forward, following the sound she thought she'd heard. Strike, no catch. Quivering strike, no catch. She crept closer and closer to the corner of the library by the window, where the furnace had been. She rushed forward, rounded the corner of the shelf, hoping to catch the fire starter in the act. There was no one there. No matches, no matchbook, no telltale smell of faint smoke. Only the powdery smell of dried flowers. <laughs> Sophie? 
No answer. No flickering lights or computers starting up at the circulation desk. She walked toward the circulation desk, somewhere between chilled and annoyed. Sophie? She said in her best, quiet in the library voice. I need to go home now. And there they were. Her keys were on the desk, framed by an overhead flickering fluorescent light. The only one on in the entire building. (laughs) She kept herself from saying thank you, but she did nod appreciatively in no particular direction as she locked the exterior doors behind her. She planned to come in to Harvey Public Library early tomorrow, just in case. Somehow, she knew that if she left Sophia alone for too long, she might lose more than just your keys. Thanks for listening to Haunted Places. A new episode comes out every Thursday. Listen to all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast directory. Many of you have asked how to help the show. And if you enjoy Haunted Places, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. We'll see you next week. Haunted Places was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Ron Shapiro with production assistance by Joel Stein, Paul Mahler, Maggie Admire, and Carly Madden. Haunted Places is written by Lil DeRitter and Jennifer Riche. I'm Greg Polson. And now, please enjoy this preview of Mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess, Athena. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face, dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycalos. Athena had a divine, godly strength. Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. 
she'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war. And it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday, we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today, we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of Parcast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At Parcast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine. And this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache. And Zeus's son, Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, Oh, headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? 
Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Oh. Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Oh, make it stop. End it. I'll cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans with human flaws and emotions, there is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother. So after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! <laughs> Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like palace to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The proud fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. 
Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you- She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas' sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. Getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.